the University at Buffalo Office of Accreditation and Assessment welcomes you to this presentation. Program Assessment Using Embedded Course Assignments as Assessment Data An embedded assessment can include any measurable activity, exam questions, lab assignments, presentations, case studies, written assignments, fieldwork. Regardless of the type of assignment used, the goal of an embedded assessment is to collect measures of performance at the course level and aggregate this data to examine excellence at the program level. Since faculty members are engaged in assessment as part of their regular teaching activities, it only makes sense to try to harness some of that effort for program level assessment. By doing so, activities become more efficient, with some course assignments serving multiple purposes. With embedded assessment, virtually any course, exam, or assignment that addresses program level learning outcomes can be used for program level assessment. Within our department, we are accredited by, by ABET. It's an accreditation board in, in science and technology. Um, when we started this process, um, it was difficult for us to come to grips with the fact that uh, grades alone were not sufficient. Uh, but after reading some of the literature and becoming more familiar with the issues, uh, we have come to grips with it. We now understand things like rubrics and other things that can, can help us in this regard. Uh, there could be many reasons why the student does poorly in the course. Moreover, over time, if you have different instructors, uh, different instructors might have different grading schemes, different scales, different curves, so on and so forth. And so what exactly a particular grade means from year to year may evolve. Assessments collected from student performance on course assignments can be aligned with course objectives and be used to provide evidence of student achievement of curriculum and program learning outcomes, which align to university strategic goals and learning outcomes. Um, a committee of individuals comes up with the program goals and we ask faculty members to take those program goals and match up their course objectives to their program goals. Uh, the topic of energy balances is something that's introduced in a sophomore level class, CE 212, uh, and then it's a concept that is used in many of our higher level classes. So for example, in uh, CE 304, uh, this is a topic that's reinforced and applied. Uh, CE 329 and CE 407 are junior level classes in reaction engineering and in separations, uh, respectively, uh, where energy balances are often used as an auxiliary type of, of thing. Basically, faculty members, for your courses, you already have your course objectives. You're the expert in your course. And when we reach out to the faculty, we, when I reach out to the faculty, I say that. I say, you know, you're the one, you're the expert in your course. I teach statistics, that's what I know. I don't know everything there is to know about finance and economics. and so we really need the faculty member to be engaged in that process. So they look at their course, they take their course objectives, and they try to match them up to one or more, or maybe none, of the program goals. Not every course objective necessarily matches up to a program goal. And that being said, um, when you have, obviously you're gonna have several program goals, your course doesn't have to match up to every single one of the program goals. Your course isn't, the entirety of your program. So you're going to have several different courses that are going to match up to all these goals and you're just one little piece of the puzzle. So that said, it's like with a puzzle, you don't want to try to force it. You don't want to try to force your objectives to match up to a program goal just because you think you should or because you think somebody told you you had to. You want to make it match because it does match, because it naturally fits together. And then just like when you're putting a puzzle together, then in the end, when all the pieces are put together, you'll have a cohesive unit. Aligning program goals with learning outcomes allows faculty to sync course objectives to program goals. Objectives can be linked to specific courses through embedded assessments. Embedded assessments can then be tracked across a number of courses in the curriculum. This process provides content level, course level, and curriculum level assessment data to be used in program level assessment. So let's, uh, in order to understand this better, let's take a look at a typical exam type of problem that you might ask uh, and see uh, where the flaws might lie in terms of just using uh, a simple grade for the problem. 
OK, so here's an example problem that I picked. It's a typical exam type problem that you might see uh, within this course CE212. So it has to do with uh, argon, a gas that enters in uh, a compressor at certain condition, leaves at other conditions. And the students are asked to determine uh, the power input required for the, the compressor. OK, so if, if you were to write out uh, a typical solution for this, uh, a typical handwritten solution that you give back to the students might look like what you see here. So within this, uh, there are a number of different components. Uh, let me start off by highlighting that part of the problem that pertains to the energy balance. So this is really what we're interested in assessing, whether they can do this particular part of the problem that you see within the box here, whether they can formulate the general energy balance, and whether they can then make the appropriate uh, assumptions and appropriate simplifications that are required in order to get to the expression that you see that's the bottom of, of the box. All of the other parts of this problem are, are auxiliary. Uh, so in order to implement this in the end, they have to calculate something called a, a mass flow rate. Um, that's something that comes, that's also introduced in the course, but is sort of a, a separate topic. Uh, embedded with the mass flow rate is also application of something we call the ideal gas equation of state. Uh, as part of this problem, they also have to look up property values from a, a table. Again, doesn't have directly to do with the energy balance uh, per se. So the basic idea of, of a rubric is that you take a problem, a problem like we just saw, and you break it down into a series of key rubric steps. Maybe there are four or five, something like that. Uh, and each step uh, points to a particular topic or particular outcome that you're interested in assessing throughout the curriculum. And for each rubric step, uh, you then provide a score. And you set up the rubrics throughout the curriculum such that you use a, a, a common scoring scheme. And we'll, we'll see an example of that in just a minute. So let's take a look at how we might break this problem down that I just mentioned. So here in the boxes, you see um, the definition of each rubric step that we introduce. And by way of background in our program, uh, we tag each of these rubric steps with three different criteria, uh, something called an ABET outcome, which is uh, specific to, to engineering. It's specific to our accreditation body. The second item that you see there is, is a topic. Uh, the third item that you see is, is a bloom level. Uh, so in terms of the breakdown, we might uh, break this down into uh, a step that involves calculation of the flow rate, a step that involves using this ideal gas equation of state. Uh, the one on the upper right is, is the one that we're interested in. This has to do with uh, assessing the ability to do the energy balance. Uh, another one has to do with this ability to look data up in an appropriate table. And then we might define a, a sort of generic step as to whether or not students are able to simply perform the appropriate arithmetic. So in doing this problem, you have to add, subtract, multiply, divide. Um, and we want to know whether students are able to do that, uh, rarely rudimentary skill in, in a proficient way. So here's what uh, one of these rubric tables look like within our program. Um, Within the table, each row uh, corresponds to one of these rubric steps. Uh, it has a generic name associated with it, and then these three indicators that we've mentioned. The topic, the ABET, and the bloom level. And you then see, uh, in terms of the, the columns, the rightmost columns, uh, a selection of students that we've picked. So in this case, we're assessing five students. And for each of the students, we give a, a relatively coarse-grained score. So the scores span from 0 to 3. Uh, zero being highly deficient, and three being highly proficient. And so at the end, uh, we construct this table that gives these scores. Uh, and we're able to uh, receive from this uh, some metric for how well students are able to do with respect to each of these specific topics. At the bottom of the table, you'll also see um, the student scores. So the maximum on score on this problem uh, for this exam was 30 points. And you see uh, the scores that these five students got. These are the scores that you might use in a traditional sort of grading scheme. Uh, the advantage of breaking it down into rubric steps is that you can focus specifically on those program outcomes that you're interested in. In some sense, this helps you uh, provide a, a picture of what 
a, a score of, of 20 out of 30 or 25 out of 30 mean? Uh, it might help you to say that, okay, a, a typical student that gets two-thirds of the points, well, a typical student that does that, maybe they can do part of the energy balance, uh, but they struggle with respect to the math or they struggle with respect to the ideal gas equation of state part of it. Uh, maybe another student that gets 20 points, uh, they were only able to do a little bit of the energy balance, and the, but all the other parts they were able to put together well. So it gives you this relationship uh, between how students do grade-wise and how students do in terms of the overall more detailed uh, rubric. In the end, when we have our rubrics that the faculty members turn in, every objective has its own criteria. So we have an objective and the different ways to measure it, which as I said, might be different levels of the course, might be homework assignments, case studies, final exam questions, down to the specific question level, and then the criteria for the percentage of whether they've met it, marginally met it, or have not met it. So this uh, rubric is really um, just a chart. Uh, across uh, one column, you would have the various criteria that you would be using to uh, evaluate a given assignment. And then uh, across the top, uh, you would have a series of uh, different standards. So you might say A, B, C, or you might do something like exceeds uh, the standard, meets the standard, rises to meet it, doesn't meet it. Um, I prefer the latter because I think it gives you a little bit more uh, flexibility in terms of actually doing the final evaluation because usually your criteria are weighted. Some of the criteria are very important, other criteria uh, not so much. <clears throat> and so I think it's easier, uh, especially for students, um, to not use the grades. It gives you a little bit more flexibility in terms of uh, what the final evaluation is that you're going to make. Now, of course, the uh, criteria that you're going to establish are going to be um, specific to a discipline or a course. Um, but given that, within that, um, you would still have some general areas that every rubric is going to include. The first area, I think it's fairly obvious and has to do with course content. Right? So uh, any given assignment is probably asking students to demonstrate their understanding of certain material within the course or to undertake a particular activity that's related to the discipline. So that would be your first general area of evaluation. Uh, beyond that, you would have what I would call rhetorical, um, rhetorical criteria. And these might have to do with things like purpose. Uh, is there a given purpose for this assignment? Has the student identified a purpose and achieved it? Uh, audience awareness. Uh, every assignment is going to have a different sense of audience, perhaps beyond the individual faculty member that's doing the evaluation. Um, and then I think most familiarly to uh, faculty, uh, to the genre that you're writing in. So, for example, a lab report would have certain kinds of conventions, a way of organizing certain kinds of uh, practices for uh, in inserting evidence, certain kinds of evidence that would be appropriate, uh, that would be different from, say, a case study or a form of literary analysis. And finally, you might want to consider uh, stylistic uh, or formal kinds of criteria. And these might have to do with things like the use of a particular citational apparatus like APA or even things like spelling or grammar and things like that that um, sometimes faculty uh, want to evaluate. And I guess my recommendation in terms of that, I think, is that you would want to collect, connect your criteria uh, to your um, course goals or your program goals. Right? So if you were placing a lot of evidence, uh, emphasis on APA style, correct use of APA style, then um, clearly you would want to be spending a lot of time in class teaching students how to use APA style. Uh, and so I think that you, you just need to uh, have some uh, kind of correspondence uh, between those uh, elements. The embedded assessment, a rubric for evaluating learning outcomes against a common set of criteria, is more effective than grades alone. They help students to gauge individual performance and faculty to assess student learning. Embedded assessments also provide faculty with granular data for content refinement and departments for teaching and course evaluation. 
The same assessment data can be leveraged by schools for program assessment and ultimately as evidence in college and university accreditation. If we had a way of keeping track of the rubrics uh, that, are, uh, that are done, performed, completed, uh, in a variety of different courses, uh, we can then look at all of those rubrics that have something to do with an energy balance. And of course, we'd have some of those rubrics in the initial course that it's introduced, this course CE212. Um, but then the energy balance would also appear as an auxiliary type of item in subsequent courses. So those that I mentioned before, like in our case, CE407, CE408, so on and so forth. And so what we'd be interested in doing is taking a look at all that information, putting it together in some sort of notebook, and evaluating the notebook to see how well students first obtain uh, proficiency in that particular program outcome, and then how well they retain it as they move through the curriculum. Perhaps we see that they do well in terms of, you know, ostensibly they, they, they get it just fine in CE 212, but then later we see deficiencies in them being able to apply it in a, a higher level context. And so if that's the case, we'd want to understand the reasons for that, and perhaps go back to 212, perhaps do something in terms of shuffling the overall curriculum in order to address those concerns. If you've been teaching the course for a number of years, you tend to look at it with the same glasses all the time. And this way you can step outside the box and say, okay, well, what are the students seeing? Or, you know, I thought this worked really well, but goodness, only 50% of my students got that question right on the final. And when you're grading your final exams or having somebody else grade your finals, you tend to not look at that always. You look at the entire grade of the final. And yeah, you can look and say 85% of the students, you know, earned a 75 or more in the final. But when you take it down to the specific question level, now all of a sudden you can determine, oh, well, on, you know, on this content in my course, really, maybe I should be doing something more to help the students. So I think that it can be a very valuable tool when you take it out of the context of something you have to do and you turn it into the context of something that you can use to help you improve your course. You can show your students the rubric. It's not, it shouldn't be a secret. I mean, just as you would put your goals uh, on the syllabus of, for your course, uh, you can show your students um, the rubric that you're using and have a conversation about what is important in the assignment and why you think it's important and what the various criteria mean. And then I think that becomes a way uh, of them, especially if you've given them a chance to draft their papers and you know get some feedback on them, as we often do in composition, uh, that becomes an opportunity for them to look at the criteria and say, am I meeting the standards that have been achieved uh, for the course? So I think it's probably a good idea to share the rubric with your students so that they know what it is you're looking for them to do. What can I do to continually improve? And that's the thing with assessment is Rather than looking at it as a daunting task, you can look at it as a tool and you can look at it as a way to, you know, step outside of the box for a moment and look from the observer's standpoint. So overall, this type of process of breaking problems down in terms of a rubric uh, first allows you to address the first general question that I mentioned. Uh, are students proficient in a particular program outcome by the time they finish a course that that is introduced within? Uh, and moreover, it also allows you to look at more of a curriculum spanning uh, type of issue where you're looking at whether students are able to retain that and apply it in later courses. This has been Program Assessment, using embedded course assignments as assessment data. We hope you have enjoyed our production and thank you for watching. This video and more can be found on our website. Our special thanks to faculty members Jeffrey Arrington, Diana Sihaki, and Alex Reed for sharing their expertise on this topic. We would also like to thank the professional staff who provided their creative and technical support for this production. For more information about this presentation or accreditation and assessment services, please contact the UB Office of Accreditation and Assessment or the Teaching and Learning Center.